Whatever you may now think about ghosts, about spirits, put that on hold. The next hour could change everything. The story begins here in this sad ruin. We're on the fringes of the Australian outback. Through this place, we will reveal the chilling secrets of what may well be the most haunted town in the Western world. This is not a place to send your spirit soaring. A fence cannot contain a soul. This is a town with a history. Australia's first mining town. The copper has long gone. Now nothing moves on what was once the busiest few acres on the continent. But many questions remain. A girls' reformatory. Almost a century ago, St John's was suddenly closed. Why? And what of the stories of a crazed priest who continued to live on here? Is this desolate place the holy of haunteds in a tormented town? Could it be there are more spirits trapped here than anywhere on earth? Kapunda is the most haunted town that I have ever heard of anywhere, and that includes the United States, Canada, England, Europe. I'm looking at 34 different buildings and about just over 40 different ghostly appearances. Even though it's just 80 kilometres north of Adelaide, Kapunda could be in the middle of nowhere. These days, it's shrunk back into its own valley. A forgotten neighbour between two of the world's great wine regions, the Barossa and the Clare. Kapunda is a town of once upon a time. Once a frontier town, the site of Australia's first mining boom. A place where men came to seek their fortunes from the copper-laden ground. Life was hard. Most found only disappointment. So where does this strangeness come from? Perhaps the harsh life that led to disease and early death? Or could it be the town's deeply religious past? Lutherans, Anglicans and Irish Catholics crammed into an isolated outpost. And what of the woman who will become Australia's first saint of the Catholic Church? Personal diaries of Mary MacKillop tell of hauntings here. We are here preparing this place as a home for young girl prisoners. Of course, this is the place that has been for so long known to be haunted. Yet the town's solid homes talk of a time of hope, of certainty. More than 100 of them live on past the century mark. Some of them with a history wrought in iron, wheat, minerals. Once home to 30,000, these days Kapunda rejoices in its history. But it's a history that chooses the night for return visits. This is a journey that will take us through the stories of this town. For here there are places, buildings, ruins, so charged with the unusual, the inexplicable, that many locals refuse to go there. But there are definitely ghosts around in Kapan, and that's definitely the case. I still couldn't bring myself to go in that room in the dark. And Barry says, why is the ghost hiding under the bed covers? When it happens on a daily basis, you've got your children screaming. This is real. It is um, strange. I, mean, I suppose doing this is strange. It's just from this point on, from this point on, it's really different, like degrees colder. I think that there's something here. 
but I don't think they're going to do they or anyone any harm. <sighs> Writer Kevin McNeil has been studying Kapunda for most of the past decade. His discoveries are revealing and disturbing. This is virtually like in the movie Aliens, where they say, in space, no one can hear you scream. No one will hear you scream here either. This should be one of the most celebrated religious sites in Australia. Instead, it is its shame. Religion, St John's and its failure, play a central role in what is troubling this town. It may well have been a girls' reformatory, and in itself not a place for nice girls, but nothing can account for stories of rogue priests, of pregnancies, abuse, of terminations, horror, and burials in unmarked graves. Well, historically, it was the first Catholic church built outside of Adelaide in South Australia, the first Catholic priest ordained in South Australia, and the first Catholic priest who died extremely suddenly uh, on duty in South Australia in 1860. The following four years, uh, four other priests who came up here also died here in this manse. From that time on, Mary McKillop and her group had a school here until 1877. The last time the church itself was used was in 1882. And then in 1897, Mary McKillop was asked by Archbishop O'Reilly to help supervise and help with the building alterations for the girls' reformatory. History may well explain the extraordinary power of this place and the malevolent presence of the insane priest in residence, Father James Martin. Why did the local priests make life so difficult for Mary McKillop? What were they hiding? The nastiness connected with that was connected with the fact that a priest was allowed to live up there, where the State Children's Council didn't want to, the Archbishop wouldn't take any notice of them, Certain events took place that allegedly resulted in uh, pregnancies, terminations of same, because girls in the reformatory run only exclusively by women can't get pregnant unless there are males involved. Father Martin lived those last tortured years here in this room. He died on his own up there, a demented man in 1921. Many still feel his brooding presence today. I just feel as though I'm going to, if I walk across there, I'm dead. You know, I'm, um, it, it's a dead room. For local artist Rick Thiel, to just return to this place, he has to break through a spiritual barrier. Each previous journey has produced visitations, cold fear. For him, mid-afternoon is terrifying. Someone, something, does not want him here. It's, it's, uh... It's just death. It, it's everything associated with death. Uh, it, it's, um, I, I, I don't know how you guys can be in there. I can't, I just can't. I'm sorry, I can't, I just can't. Um, I, I've, you know, you guys seem to walk around and don't, re don't hear it, don't feel it. Um, I don't know what, what, what it is. Um, uh, let's, Rick Thiel's time at St John's produced not only a fear of Father Martin, but his psychic powers seemed to detect a strangeness surrounding the unmarked section of the cemetery at the bottom of the hill. Here, some of the girls from the reformatory are buried. That grave over in the corner worries me, though. Something unusual about that. Rick's connection that would also lead to a confronting visit to his home by a ghostly young girl. She basically gave me a hug and basically it was, it was really quite casual, like, uh, oh, just in the neighbourhood, thought I'd call in. <laughs> and I actually thought somebody had said hello and it just sort of flitted off. And then I realised that um, I'd, I was standing in this drenching cold rain and I came inside as white as a ghost, um, no pun intended, and and I just stood there and everybody, suddenly a couple of people looked at me and said, what's wrong? 
my hands were boiling hot and absolutely dry. And it was four degrees that night. Um, and where she'd hugged me was dry. The year was 1980, when 14 Kapunda school children came out here on a dare. It was a bright moonlit night. They chose a double grave to gather around. They waited. Then came a raw scraping sound. What they saw fixed them in terror. A young girl in a long white gown carrying a lantern moved through the cemetery. The seemingly transparent figure floated up the hill towards the reformatory before returning to the cemetery and disappearing into the earth. Earth that was left damp and with a message. There was a round circle, wet circle. Within that circle were the numbers lowercase, what they thought was a B, uh, an R, and then a V with the number nine. I believed that they got the P, they got the B mixed up with a P, and PRV9 means Proverbs 9. I looked up Proverbs 9, and chapter 18 in Proverbs 9 states the following, but he knoweth not that the dead are there, a lowercase h, so they didn't mean the divinity, and her guests are in the depths of hell. Kevin McNeil now believes he knows who that girl is, the same one who took comfort from Rick Thiel. Her name, Ruby Bland, resident of the reformatory, buried in an unmarked grave. It's said she died giving birth on November the 28th, 1909, the same day Archbishop O'Reilly announced the closure of St John's. It is almost as if this place lives on memories. History plagues Kapunda. One of Australia's most gruesome mass murders happened nearby. This very cell held the seven Aboriginal men accused of killing Mrs Rainbird and her young family. Every day during the inquest, the men huddled inside the cell while mounted troopers tried to control a lynch mob baying for their blood. They were eventually taken to Adelaide for trial. The four found guilty were hung. Today, strange things still happen in both the cells and the adjacent courthouse. There's no way I'll sleep in the courthouse at night. Clive Hughes is the proud owner of a building he wouldn't go into at night until now. But I've had some strange um, experiences in here, so... Um, I'm expecting to hear some noises. Maybe some footsteps or some banging noises. Everything's very quiet at the moment. But I'm not comfortable in here. No, I'm gonna keep moving. I think I'll move outside now, it's not too flush in here. I won't go in the courthouse again. Clive lasted eight minutes, First turned off the night vision camera and left. It seems the courthouse has been like this for ages. Former owner Sonia Lee had more than one experience. I um, walked up to a couple of steps up to the podium and I felt this leg across my two legs and I tripped and I fell flat on my face and I thought well, this is strange you're dreaming you know because I really could feel it I was fast asleep and I woke up and 
there was this evil. You could feel it. And it was that bad that didn't even dare move or breathe. Normal people here see things, feel things. Visitations and sightings do not only plague believers. Skeptics like Laura Marshall admit that. Well, I was out at the reformatory. It would have been a couple of years ago now. And I actually went out, I was doing a, a newspaper article for one of the local papers. And uh, I decided that I would actually look at some of the early graves that actually are out at the reformatory. And uh, basically looking straight ahead on the left-hand window of the front of the reformatory, I saw a black figure of a man pass through there with quite a wide brim hat on and like a long black cloak. And I wouldn't have believed it, but I was actually with somebody else at the time. And they looked at me and said, did you see that? And I looked at them and said, did you see that? But it is not about seeing things. Stare at a wall long enough and you'll start seeing things. A face, a figure. But in this town, there are so many with experience. Experience that many seem to have shared. I was over there looking out towards the front door. The front door was open, moonlight night, and a figure walked across the doorway. And I uh, didn't say anything. I went out, I came back, I picked up a piece of paper, and I sketched what I saw. It is the likeness of Monsignor George Williams, parish priest who died in Kapunda in 1920. And I heard three distinct knocks, very strong knocks. And I just laid and listened and they would come in groups of three and then there'd be a small gap between them. And I looked around the room and thought, now where could they be coming from? And there was just nowhere. Out of sheer terror, I just blurted out the Lord's Prayer and it stopped. And uh, from then on, more things started to occur. The TV would be turned up full volume. The radio in the kitchen would be turned up full volume. Um, I had some little statues that would be turned around facing the other way. Um, and the smells. The smells were probably the most terrifying. And I remember one night I came home from a, a rehearsal and my brother was outside of the house quite distressed and I said, what's the matter with you? He said, I'm not going back inside that house. And I said, why? What's happened? Where are the kids? He said, inside the house. And I said, well, what's happening? What's going on? He said, oh, he said there were footsteps and no one there. There was a baby crying. He said the dog and the cat went crazy. He said, I'm not going back in there. And so I went inside the house and yes, the dog and cat just dived at my legs and would not leave my side. And I rang the minister and he said, just get out of the house. At the minister's urging, she told her story to the congregation. She says half believed her and the other half dismissed her. Kapunda is one of those rare Australian towns where there were almost more churches than pubs. By any reckoning, it is a very religious town, even today. But religion has no answer for the challenge facing Donna Warner. Her home is literally infested with ghosts. When something happens to you immediately, it, it frightens the life out of you. But when it happens on a daily basis, you've got your children screaming, coming out of rooms through the day because there's a man in the room, or your child wakes up a week after Christmas screaming because there's a little boy in bed with him. And you know very well that there's an elderly man that walks around here, you've seen them yourself, or you know that there's a little boy drowned a hundred years ago in our underground rainwater tank, you know they're here. You have clocks that don't work, that tick, you have cupboards that, that open and shut in front of you in broad daylight. You have images walk past the window and you know there's no one here. You know, we had a pram went up our driveway 20 foot on a, on a day exactly like today with very little wind. We can't explain that. If there is one building that everyone believes is the most haunted place in the town itself, it's this place, the North Kapunda Hotel. The pub has seen busier days, but nowadays many guests live on here, ignoring the moderate tariff.
I'll leave those handles in a position. And um, quite often I'll go down there and that's not how I left them. So I started then to be deliberate in how I set them up and invariably they do, they do change. Imagine how it would feel not to be welcome in your own business. When Heather Hogan took over here, she knew it was haunted. After all, the previous owner, Sheila Puro, told her. We sort of um, heard babies crying upstairs and we went looking for them and couldn't find them and they slowly went away. Doors opening and closing, shoes going missing quite a lot. You know, you get one, you haven't got the other one, you go and it's in another room. Uh, crockery, cutlery on the table when some of the girls, when they set the dining room up, went out and come back in again and all the knives would be missing. This room um, has a, a feeling, I have no idea what I feel in this room, but I don't feel me in this room. And I have a, um, a piano back in the corner with a little table lamp on it, which I switch off before I go to bed. And there's lots of ornaments and stuff on that piano. And um, invariably, when I walk towards that piano, those ornaments rattle. And um, I didn't take a lot of notice of it, just in the beginning because these floors are, are wooden and uneven and whatever. But then I started to take a bit of notice because sometimes it didn't happen. I thought, well, that's a bit strange. Why is it not happening tonight and why did it happen last night? So I thought, well, maybe there is somebody living in this room. So I now I go up to there and if it's happening, I just say, well, excuse me, I'm just about to turn the light off and good night and I walk out. But it is the cellar of this hotel that has the most sinister reputation. Alone in the cellar, Heather Hogan feels uncomfortable. Now you can see here two rooms, this would have been. Um, this would have been um, uh, the, the uh, servants' quarters. Um, you can see a fireplace down the, down the end there and perhaps a bedroom or something like that. I don't particularly like that room. Um, it um, doesn't give me a very good vibes in that room at all because, uh, well, I don't know, there seems to be somebody else living down here who uh, either doesn't want me around, I don't know. But I don't feel really, really welcome in that room. At the back of the hotel, there's another staircase for, for the cellar. Um, they have uh, a pair of batwing doors, which are very heavy, full length of the doors. They've got no locks on, but they do come in together. They do open outwards. Now, for those doors to open outwards on their own, you're going to have to have a, a very strong wind internal of the hotel. That's absolutely impossible. I shut them and I'll get up in the morning and they're open. Doors that open by themselves, the cold, the crying, the fear that many feel for this cellar, can it be just imagination? I was not to know at the time, but soon I would have my own disturbing confrontation in the North Kapunda Hotel Cellar. Uh, what's that? Oh, shit. Like many old Australian towns, most of Kapunda's houses are outwardly very charming. They sit comfortably, aged facades invigorated with paint and new iron. But some have inclusions that make them very hard to sell. The house was uh, number one Chapel Street, I believe. And uh, a few years ago, we had the opportunity to uh, put the property on the market. And there were a couple of ladies that came through and the house is virtually two storeys, but this, the base story is underground. And um, this lady was really very, very frightened. After we'd shown her through, she just turned a very um, wider shade of grey and ran out of the building saying, I can't stand the feel in here. 
The property was rented out for some time before we put it on the market and it had nothing to do with my office, but it was rented out and I believe that some of the people that stayed there said at night time there were some very strange noises, doors used to open and close, funny winds going through the place and whatever. Um, and they even used to lock the doors by themselves, some people said, so who's to say? We don't know. Sifting the secrets of this town, Kevin McNeil uncovered uncomfortable stories. Like the house on the old Adelaide Road. There's an unspoken agreement that it will never be rented to women of childbearing age. I call the pregnant angry house. And that is a house where young women uh, who go to live there, if they become pregnant while they're there, there's a whole lot of very nasty poltergeist type activity which turns into something even nastier. When I say poltergeist, it means that crockery starts flying around the room and chairs get moved, etc. But eventually it gets to the stage where not only the oppression is so bad in the house, but the women will start to bleed from, from everywhere. And um, on one occasion, a woman was taken, bundled into a car by friends to, to head up towards the hospital. And by the time they got halfway up the road, up Main Street, uh, the, uh, the bleeding had stopped and when they got to the hospital they couldn't find any reason why she should have been bleeding in the first place. Some of the spirits here are malevolent, desirous to do evil to others. But many seem just to be seeking solace that avoided them in life. It's around half past 12, one o'clock. There's a nudge on the end of the bed and it woke me up and I find out it was a uh, a child about, well, I suppose, nine, ten years old, in a white gown, long blonde hair, probably all past halfway down her back, and just nudging the end of the bed. I got home and Barry says, why does the ghost hiding under the bed covers? <clears throat> and he said, he just said, how long have you been home? I said, well, I've just walked in the back door. He said, no, you haven't. You've been here for a long time, haven't you? I said, no, I just walked in the back door. And he said, well, there's somebody in the house. And For Barry and Margaret Jarvis, there's no escaping their ghost. Four times they've moved house, and so has it. As Barry said, she takes six to eight months and she finds us. I don't honestly know. She's still here. Why? I don't know. When she'll go, I don't know. As I said, we've never gone into it any further because she's never done us any harm. It seems the ghost's lifelong attraction is the Jarvis's daughter. My vision is she's probably a little bit small, just about this high, just a little bit small and she wears white dresses and she's blonde. And most times I do see her holding a noose and other times I do see her holding, carrying a baby in her arms. Perhaps it's this small town's matter-of-fact approach to their ghosts that allows Kapunda to go about its business untroubled. But it doesn't answer the question, why Kapunda and why so many ghosts? One theory that's been espoused around the place is that because of the height of the water levels and the amount of metal that's there, Basically, a, a magnetic attraction type thing has been created. Strange things just keep piling up. On the first night, we captured this impossible image at sunset. It is not, not the moon. Huh. Not a flare. It's not a flare. There's not a flare because I'm panning. Here we get a. Wow. Not a flare. My handheld digital camera switched off at the exact moment I had a very strange encounter. And then when I tried to explain what happened, the camera suffered electrical interference in the same location and at the precise time that I mentioned the encounter. And the sounds, just to clarify, those like three, they weren't always three, sometimes they were three, two, one. The zoom on the shot you are now watching operated of its own accord. It was later discovered the electric zoom control was not connected to the camera. And what is the explanation for this? Photographs of the old Catholic manse. The family that lived here swears it's haunted and took these photos. 
experts are at a loss. Same too with these shots from the cellar of the North Kapunda Hotel. What are those smoke-like images? There are strange powers that encircle this place. But why are these people so at home, so comfortable with their ghosts? Perhaps it's because they have no choice. There is one thing the people who live here will avoid at all costs. Staying alone overnight in their town's most haunted buildings. But it's something I simply had to do. This, for me, is the point at which Kapunda's story becomes a personal journey. Not just a search for something outside the normal, but a test of my own inner strength. Three nights that changed my life. I came to Kapunda with an open mind to talk with the locals, to try to discover what lies deep in the town's troubled past. Were the seeds of unease sown during Australia's first great mining boom here? Did the harsh life in the 1800s leave lost souls unable to find peace in death? There are so many questions and so many stories here, it's hard to know where to start. Those ruins of the old reformatory and the site of St John's Church. The original jail and courthouse complex. Or the North Kapanda Hotel. They're all haunted according to locals the most haunted places in a town full of ghosts. Hearing stories is one thing, but I had to find out the truth for myself. That meant staying alone all night in the three places the locals fear and avoid more than anywhere else. In time, I would face up to the sheer power of St John's Reformatory. But first, I had to spend the night in the old jail and courthouse, where even the owner won't stay after dark. So I've had a, a fairly bad experience there during the day. Uh, I went to sleep in there at one stage and um, had a lot of difficulty waking up and seemed to have a pressure on me. I guess I haven't really got that uh, brave to spend a night in there yet. So my first vigil began. Keep in mind, these pictures are from a night vision camera. Through the viewfinder, I could only see what you can see. All around me, darkness. Yeah, I get the tingles here. If you were just, uh, in a normal day, you wouldn't notice it. You'd just think, chill down the spine, so what? But in these places, you start to relate them a little bit. This is the room Clive woke up feeling as if he was suffocating. And this is icy cold. Yeah. What was that? I'm hearing a deep, like a moan, like wind. This is the door. Where apparently the figure likes to enter and walk all the way down there to the other door.
Charlie is not a praise. <sighs> the acoustics in here are unbelievable. Someone showing himself to me. There is no light source in here. And it's staying in the same position. What is that? I've heard that moaning noise again. I heard it. Just then, I don't know whether the mic is good enough to pick that up. He might be building up a bit of muscle to come and see me. Probably not till I'm at my weakest, which would be mid-morning or something. Right. Moan! Bastard. It's the same sound over and over again in spasms. It comes in and it sounds like wind. Batteries. There is not a breath of wind. See, I've lost as to whether I'm imagining sounds or hearing sounds. Um, but the air in here is very hard. Very hard is the word. Oh, did you hear that? Oh, I hate that. Was that me? Where's that coming from? Oh, let's go check the doors. doubt the light reflection was just that but the moans the knocking sound and the moving door I know they occurred just after midnight I moved on to the old police station and cells a building where in the 1850s slaughter was paid for dearly and where not long ago Sonia Lee lived my ex-husband was playing cards and people could hear voices and we went and had a look and there's nobody about nobody not anywhere to be seen 
and sometimes you could hear the voices, but you couldn't hear what they were saying. And you could hear mainly men talking. I lived in Amsterdam in houses that were about three or four hundred years old. And you could feel things in there, but not as distinct as I could feel it here. is it not? Well, that's the line I'm trying to find. What is imagination and what is real? And sometimes they get in a bit of a swirl. Ah. Oh, Jesus, that'd give you a heart attack. Oh, you can't say I'm not being honest here. forces at play in both the courthouse and jail. I certainly heard things, and I absolutely felt powerful intrusions of energy. And there is one thing I cannot explain. 
I was on the far side of the room when this happened. By day, the North Kapunda Hotel sits quietly on the same corner it has for over a century. Its trade, a few locals and the tourists who've heard stories of ghosts in the cellar. There is a youngish female there because this youngish female was spotted by the previous licensee, uh, Sheila, who mistook her for her young daughter. Her partner at the time was counting the takings of the pokies machine and this figure was standing in front of her partner, waving her arms around and doing all these fantastic... The partner didn't even know it was happening. Uh, so the person concerned is, is frivolous, curious. Owner Heather Hogan knows there are other people here apart from paying customers. Um, the serviettes, um, they are just folded in a, in a fan shape. But invariably, they because I've got them all sitting very um, symmetrically around the, the tables, and uh, invariably they get turned and twisted in the mornings, and I come like, ah, leave my table alone. And I go around and, and straighten them all up again. One night, ten, no, seven, seven off that big long table disappeared. Mm, my grandfather's clock. That's another thing in this, in this uh, hotel that... Um, is a bit of a mystery. It's got a, a uh, glass face which opens for me to wind it up and uh, every morning, or not every morning, but five out of ten, say, it's open. And uh, yeah, so I've got to come every morning and shut that clock face up. But in the ominous cellar, she is definitely not at ease. I've gone downstairs and I've sat on that heap of stones down there and I think, why, what am I feeling down here? But I can't put two and two together in there at all, not at all. There's something, something quite, um, I don't know, something unhealthy down in that room. It just doesn't, doesn't feel welcoming at all. And what about these photographs taken in the cellar? Imagination? At the back of the hotel, there's another staircase for, for the cellar. Um, they have uh, a pair of batwing doors, which are very heavy, full length of the doors. I shut them, and I'll get up in the morning and they're open. So now, it was my turn to try to capture on video the ghosts of the hotel cellar. What happened would both chill and challenge my preconceptions about how lost souls choose to communicate. The stories these walls could tell. This feels... <sighs> Just gotta keep breathing here to... Uh, keep breathing deeply, that is. Have a look at that. She's a subtle, ain't it, scary, isn't it? These are the doors where the photograph was taken of the spirit or whatever. Oh, oh, that feels weird there, I'll tell you that. Oh. Where does that go? Window to nowhere. It's just from this point on, At this point on, it's really different, like degrees colder. Wah! Wah! Ah! This is where apparently it was the room for the maid. Maybe the woman upstairs that floats around tidying things up. I think there's, there's something here. Hello? The screen isn't affecting my eyes. So. And uh, it is pitch black in here. Where's that light? Uh, down through these old tunnels. That looks... Oh, 
geez, I get it. Oh, boy. Uh, oh, it's just strange. Uh, uh. Oh. Oh. What's going on here? very tiring this. I'm in total darkness in an absolutely black room cellar that is over 150 years old. Uh, what's that? Oh, shit. Okay, I lost my bearings totally. Fear, isolation, uh, paranoia, all uh, could account for what happened so far. But nothing could account for what happened next. I have to do this again. Because um, I may have not recorded what just happened and I don't know how to actually rewind this camera to find out. At this doorway, I was filming the doors that opened without the breeze. And the camera went off. No problems. I didn't press pause because the picture stayed on. The manual lever was in the on position, but the camera went off. I turned it to off, back on again, started it over. Entered this doorway here, and the camera went off. Three Same times the camera stopped recording, just when I thought I'd captured something. Yeah, this spirit was toying with me. You've allowed me see you on video. It was here. It was here. I am not going mad. <laughs> Funny thing. I now know how people must feel when they say they saw a ghost or heard a ghost or felt a ghost or know a ghost exists. Maybe I deserve this. But it happened to me. I had this wonderful, frisky ghost being persona, thing, play a trick on me. And I can't prove it to anyone. If there is a place in Kapunda that should be haunted, it is this place. The site of the original St. John's Church and now the ruin of the girls' reformatory. Stories abound about rogue priests and the pain inflicted on female inmates. Many who came to work here died suddenly. There are tales of pregnancies, terminations and unmarked graves. Today, many feel the dark presence of long-dead Father Martin in this room. Presence came, it came floating through here. I don't even, I don't know where it came from exactly. It was somewhere over there. And the whole presence was, he was trying to smother me. And the, the feeling was, you know, I'm gonna scare this guy half to death. And I just held the, held my breath, closed my eyes and held my breath. And uh, in the back of your mind, there's also the thought that you could die. There are stories of a cold wind that blows from nowhere and a dark figure moving from room to room. And so began my third and final vigil, the one that would have the most startling ending. There's been a lot of hurt in this place, a lot of sadness, and um, spirits are just caught in the middle world. Uh, and the, there's a reason they can't move on and they're just trying to communicate with us. So don't, the only thing that can hurt me is if I panic, uh, and I'm capable of that. Okay, this is uh, the graveyard down the bottom of the hill. The super ultra infrared thingamajig, whatever it is. 
Jesus. In it I saw a flash. I tell you, imagination is a funny thing, but I'm... The breeze has come up. That tree on the left there, I'm getting severe chills down the spine here. I think that's probably good. Um, all I can say is it gives me a chill. Someone else, somewhere else, but out here at a uh, totally different temperature than over the other side. And it's the back where, uh, where, uh, oh, Jesus, Father Martin's um, room was. I'm hearing a clear ticking sound. It's getting louder. Oh, it's like dri dripping water. There's no water out here. Can you hear it or am I just going mad here? room we're about to go into uh, two uh, two of the darkest rooms this was the, the bedroom of father Martin apparently uh, who has played some pretty dirty tricks up here they say the old fireplace in this room uh, they say uh, the figure of a young girl is seen run, running out this is totally dark, this room, to me. And the viewfinder and the camera isn't helping me. That's a, uh, a peppercorn tree. Now, all I've got is my hand in here. And it feels cold. It's got to still be 28 degrees or something out there. I'm not saying that means anything. I'm just saying... It's cold, and this is where the father apparently worked and uh, maybe even died. Now I'm in the bowels of this place now. This is the dormitory, and it's here near this fireplace where they've heard weeping, and they call it the weeping. Oh, shivers down the spine. Weeping nun. Uh, they call this the room of the weeping nun. You know, I can even hear my voice. It sounds funny. Oh, man. There you go. Down to the graveyard. Now, wouldn't you all love to be with me right now, eh? <laughs> Tell you what. This is the old tree. Oh, shit. Oh, man. What that was all about is, um, yeah, this is this old tree in the middle, halfway. As a matter of fact, on the path, the Ruby Bland path, the Father Martin path between the graveyard and the reformatory and uh, where a black figure has been seen, of course, I'm not seeing it because um, I think I'm uh, not here. Well, I'm not obviously not receptive and I don't doubt that it exists. But I was just standing there and um, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Like just a, uh, a shudder of fear. Oh, oh I don't want to do this. doing on my back to the graveyard. But this is the one that moves. Try picking that up. No chance in the world. Oh, as I felt something there. And heard something. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, ah. oh, that's no good. He's an old... 
about 1860. All the bodies were literally... Oh, Jesus, that gives you a chill. All the bodies were literally... Um, I'm not brave, I'm stupid. Oh. Jesus, what was that light? I hate that. Anyway, down here, this is a very old section. Um, and Ruby Bland has been sighted on a March evening, much like this, floating from this area of the cemetery up to the church beyond those trees, up to the reformatory beyond those trees, uh, and then floating around there and coming back down and settling in the soil here. I'm getting the shit out of here. Oh, race. to St John's. There yeah, she blows. I prefer it out here in the open paddock. But I better go back and see what's occurring. Oh, gee. I heard this like a groan, but not from this room, from further up, which is the uh, area. Yeah, I've got the chill back. It's the area I don't like, and I heard like a deep throbbing groan. Just, so this is the area where the black figure has been seen many times. Yep, and I can feel not good. I can feel very not good here. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. And you hear uh, the most minute sounds. And this is the room. room. Oh, you feel it at the doorway, I'm telling you that. I'm not saying it's evil. I'm saying it's very strong. Everyone has a right to live and die. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My throat just dries out like you wouldn't believe. And you do here. What's that? I do hear the odd groan. I, you know, I... Or I believe I hear, or I imagine I hear, or my subconscious hears. Here we go. I see a white, uh, misty form. I threw behind where my bed was. Doesn't scare me. Because it's white. It's the black I don't like. Going around there. Uh. Uh. Oh. So, um, am I starting to see things or am I starting to see things? I like the feeling when I see the white, or think I see the white, or feel I see the white. Maybe it'll match.
catch up with makes sense, I don't know. I still see that ghostly image in my mind's eye. I didn't capture it on camera, but I did see it. Those lights are a great sight. Terrifying. Well, you know, like nothing touch it, anything like that, but there's really uh, gut-wrenching um, thing. Not hurtful, you know, it couldn't hurt me. I was too psyched up for that. But, um, but I've just realised now, actually, <laughs> Uh, how much, how much emotion and energy down the graveyard too? You know, just uh, it, I think it seeps in you. It's like a, a molasses. Uh, um, but now, now I know it's powerful. Not bad. Not necessarily bad. Just strong. It's, it's strong as shit. <laughs> so whatever people tell us about this place in Campunda, I tell you, <laughs> it's here. Stay with us now on Nine for Lucy Sullivan is Getting Married, followed by Nightline and the Dally M Awards, Rugby League's Night of Nights. <laughs>